Hello, this is for chapter 3 in General Biology 1, and this is section 3.1, going into organic chemistry. So, let's look at this. Organic molecules. Notice right here, again, if something's in red, there's a good chance that you need to uh, know that particular information for the exam. Now, organic molecules always contain carbon and hydrogen. Okay, so, for example, methane gas, which is CH4, that would be an organic molecule. Carbon dioxide, which is one carbon, two oxygens, is not an organic molecule because it does not contain hydrogen. So, an organic molecule is going to contain both carbon and hydrogen. Now, beyond that, those organic molecules that are found in uh, living organisms will usually contain oxygen and quite often will contain nitrogen. So you notice we've got a hierarchy. Hierarchy. It always contains, that is organic molecules always contain carbon and hydrogen, usually oxygen, often nitrogen. These are the same four elements that we talked about earlier that uh, make up about 96% of the mass of a living organism. So those four organisms, uh, those four elements are quite important. Now another characteristic we see is an organic molecule is usually large and complex and we refer to this as a macromolecule. Now the nature of carbon is what allows these organic molecules to be so large and complex. Carbon has a characteristic that it can bond with more elements than any other type of atom. So there's one factor. Another factor is one you see in red here with a couple of asterisks on it. Each carbon, or let's state it another way, carbon will always form four co covalent bonds around itself. So carbon is sort of the ultimate Lego block. It has four connectors. Okay, so let's go down here and take a look at this. Here's a diagram from your textbook. And as you look through here, notice every time you look at this, carbon has four covalent bonds around itself, right there. Right here, this carbon has a, a double bond to another carbon and then two more bonds to hydrogens. And so carbon will always have four covalent bonds around itself. Be familiar with that. You'll probably put a diagram on the test where show carbon with one, two, three, and four covalent bonds. Ask you which could be a legitimate organic molecule. Carbon always has four covalent bonds around itself. Now the other thing to notice is we can have bonds between carbon and carbon. These bonds can be single bonds, they can be double bonds. This carbon can come back around on itself and form these complex ring structures. Uh, the carbon can be bonded to hydrogens, oxygen, somewhere in here, here's oxygen, uh, nitrogen, a wide variety of other elements. So it's the nature of carbon that allows these organic molecules to be extremely large and complex. Okay, we've got the term hydrocarbons. Now, generally when they talk about hydrocarbons in the news, they're talking about petroleum products. So, hydrocarbon, a hydrocarbon is a molecule that consists of only carbon and hydrogen. And these hydrocarbons tend to be energy rich, they're usually petroleum products, and in living organisms, we have few, if any, true hydrocarbons. But where we come close is with the fats and oils. Fats and oils have these fatty acid chains which you have predominantly just carbons and hydrogens. And so, uh, just like petroleum products are energy rich, same thing, fats and oils are very energy rich. You've got nine calories per gram on a fat or oil, only four calories per gram on a carbohydrate, or a uh, protein. Okay, so let's go down here. Isomers. Now anytime you see the term iso, it means same as. Earlier 
in the semester, we had the term isotope. Isotope is two atoms that two atoms of the same element that have different mass numbers. And remember when we talked about isotopes, we said that uh, living organisms, including us humans, cannot distinguish between the isotopes. We can't distinguish between radioactive carbon and uh, radioactive carbon-14 and the more common normal carbon-12. Our body will process those in the same manner because the difference in the isotopes is a difference due to the due to the number of neutrons in the nucleus. When two atoms come together, it's the outer shells of the electrons that are that come together. And so uh, living organisms do not distinguish between these isotopes. Isomers, on the other hand, these are compounds that have the same molecular formula but they have different structures. Uh, glucose and fructose are examples of that. We'll look at that in a second. Now, because these uh, isomers have different shapes to the molecules, then, yeah, our cells do distinguish between the isomers. Okay? And these isomers allow for one more means of increasing the diversity of the organic molecules. Now, Notice right here, we have glucose and we have fructose. Both glucose and fructose have the um, molecular formula of C6H12O6. But you can see in these diagrams that they have a different shape to the molecules. And so a different placement of those carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. And so these molecules are going to have different characteristics and they're going to function different biologically. So um, isomers are two, two compounds that have the same molecular formula, but they have different structures. And cells do distinguish between isomers. Okay? Think of it like uh, giving two kids the same pile of Lego blocks they're going to wind up putting those same Lego blocks together differently. Okay, Okay. let's look at this one. Functional groups. Now these functional groups, these are molecular structures or they're you know, groups of atoms that are incorporated into the organic molecules and these functional groups affect the property of the organic molecule. They're going to affect properties such as solubility, uh, how, the, uh, how the molecule reacts, uh, whether the molecule tends to act as a base or an acid, its biological function, and other properties as well. Okay, now in your textbook you have this table right here that lays out the different functional groups that we want to be familiar with. Let me go to this one. So, we've got it written out right here, the functional groups, and the first one we want to look at is this methyl group. And the methyl group is not listed in this table in your textbook, but, well, there it is, but it is discussed in the text portion of your book. The methyl group consists of a, this R group, which the R group is the remainder of the molecule, and the R group might be this gigantic organic molecule and then attached to that somewhere, we have this small functional group. Okay, the methyl group is different from the others because it is nonpolar and it is hydrophobic. All these other functional groups tend to be either ionic or polar. Either way, they have electrical charges. Those electrical charges interact with the electrical charges on the water, and so all of these others make the organic molecule hydrophilic. They allow it to interact with water. So we have the hydroxyl group, this OH group. We have the carbonyl group, which this is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Could be at the end of the molecule with a hydrogen attached, or the carbonyl group could be here in the middle of the molecule, and we have the remainder here, remainder here. In other words, the organic molecule or portions of the organic molecule on either side of the carbonyl group. 
Then we could combine these two into a carboxyl group. So we've got the carbonyl, carbon double bonded to oxygen, and the hydroxyl. Put those together, it makes a carboxyl group. We have the amino group. This is nitrogen with two hydrogens. Then the last two are pretty easy to identify because we only have one that has a phosphorus in it. So here's the phosphate group. And we only have one that has a sulfur. So here's the sulfhydryl group. Okay, on the exam, you will see this as a matching. I will have a list of the names, and then I will have a list of the structures. Match the names to the structures. So you need to be familiar with these functional groups. Now the functional groups, let's consider the functional groups in water. Remember you've got this large complex organic molecule and then somewhere on there you have this small functional group. Well, we've got the term hydrophobic, which means repelled by water. Nonpolar molecules tend to be hydrophobic. They have no charges to interact with charges on the water. Hydrocarbons, consisting only of carbon and hydrogen, are nonpolar hydrophobic molecules. And remember these carbon hydrogen bonds and the carbon carbon bonds are nonpolar covalent bonds. So, what this means is that methyl group is a nonpolar, uh, that is a nonpolar functional group. Okay, we've got the term hydrophilic, meaning water loving. So these are attracted to water and uh, these um, functional groups that are either polar or ionic are going to be hydrophilic or they are going to make that portion of the molecule hydrophilic. So they have charges to interact with the charges on the water and notice with a couple of asterisks on it and you will see this on the test most of these functional groups make a molecule hydrophilic. Let's go back up here for a second. Now just think about this. These organic molecules that we have associated with living organisms are generally found in a water environment. So it would make sense that most of these functional groups would make the organic molecule interact with water. So most of these functional groups are have electrical charges on them and are hydrophilic. The exception is the methyl group. Okay. Okay, so let's go down here. Now there's the R, R attached to a functional group. R stands for the remainder of the molecule. And that's the rest of the molecule other than the functional group. And this symbolism emphasizes the importance of that functional group in determining how the molecule behaves. Okay. And so once again, there is our, uh, there is our uh, table from the textbook. Okay, so we're going to stop at this point and then pick up with the next video. Thank you.